For the last few years, Namira Nani has, uh, has moderated our closing panel uh, the morning of uh, the third day. Um, Namir is the president and CEO of the Information and Communi uh, Communications Technology Council uh, for Canada, which uh, br serves as a liaison, a bridge between government and industry. Um, in that role, he's the chief strategist, driving force, bringing ICTC's center of expertise and services to industry and helping provide a liaison role to the government. Um, and as he'll describe, they enable Canada's advancement as a leader in innovation and productivity, helping advise on policy matters. Just three weeks ago, Namir was recognized for community leadership, for his spirit of collaboration, expertise, and leadership in Canada's innovation community uh, by CADA. And Thank you. Uh, I congratulate him for that. We'll be looking for some of that collaboration, expertise, and leadership this morning as we welcome Namir and his panel uh, that's looking at disruptive innovation, driving Canada's digital future. I'll turn things over to you now, Namir. Thank you. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark and Michael, for a very engaging conference. Uh, certainly, it helped the debate and rationalize some of the thought processes. You know, this discussion is going to be interesting. It's about uh, disruptive innovation. And we all know that disruptive innovation, to put it into context, is the essence of any high-performing economy. It's central to the operation of markets and the evolution of markets, and what decides competition. And at the end of the day, also, drives even further innovations. And guess what? We are in an economy of ideas, ideas that we turn into business models, products and services. We take it to market. We think we are the disruptor. And lo and behold, we are disrupted as well. So the disruptors are now getting disrupted uh, on, the, on the other hand. But you know, today's discussion is about, well, <clears throat> how do we enable some of that uh, disruptive innovation? So how do we nurture it? First of all, um, what sort of R&D are we looking at? Uh, what sort of clusters of innovation? What sort of accelerators and incubators do we need? Two is how do we embrace it? So embracing it means, you know, at the end of the day, what sort of culture of organizations do we need? Uh, but also from a government and regulatory foresight, what do we have to look at in that environment to be in tandem or ahead of the game to try to think about this, this thing? And third and most important is how do we measure innovation at the end of the day? So today, we have, we, we have a rare op opportunity with some leaders and disruptors in the place to talk about this subject. And how this will play out at, at a high level is that I will be presenting uh, the panelists, just name and title, um, because there's more information on, on the web. Um, after that, I will give them about five minutes to give their context of what they see disruptive innovation um, is and how is that important to Canada. Um, after that, I will ask some questions and then we'll potentially, if there's more time, ask them to ask questions of each other and then open it to the floor. So I would encourage you to start thinking of what questions you'd like to ask uh, because I think it's going to be very exciting. So let me start. On my far uh, left is uh, Jacques Megan. And he is the CEO of uh, the Celtic Group uh, from Europe, in fact. And it's a collaboration between government and industry, so on R&D. And it's an exciting sort of domain because we want to understand what sort of level of research and development do we need uh, on that level. After that is Angelique Mooring uh, from the CEO of Gainex. Now, this is a very fast growth uh, company, and we're very delighted to have you here to hear from all aspects of culture of organizations to scaling up to growth. And then we have um, uh, Samer Biche, who is actually a disruptor in the in this space. And I'm sure you've heard you've heard his name a couple of times in the discussion. So um, from Iristel and Ice Mobile, and we'd be excited to hear your views on on things. And Keith Leo is the product. As, you know, the Senior Vice President of Product and Innovation at Click Health. Now, it's one of the largest providers of digital health, 
and I think one of the disruptors in the space. So I think we've got an exciting, all-encompassing panel to take the subject to a whole new level. So with that, I'll ask you, Jacques, maybe if you can provide your perspectives for the next five minutes on disruptive innovation. Sure. So uh, first of all, my name is, uh, is Jacques Magin, and I am coming from, uh, from Paris in France. And I am here uh, as, as a chairman of a European research and innovation program dedicated to telecommunications that is called Celtic Plus. And Celtic Plus is part of a framework called Eureka. And I also have my own company, which is a small consultancy firm uh, uh, specialized in uh, international research and innovation. So before starting, I, I would like, of course, to thank the organizers of the summit for having invited me here and Namir for your introduction. And I also want to thank uh, very much Randy Zadra, who is the uh, Canadian representative uh, in Eureka, without whom I would not be here today. So now, I'm, I'm very much excited to be on this panel, uh, especially to talk about disruptive innovation. So let me give you a little bit of, of hints of, of the type of things that, uh, the, the way I look at disruptive innovation. So first of all, I'd like to stress uh, uh, that in order to promote disruptive inno innovation, we all need to be open, not only to new ideas, but moreover to new ideas that may not come from our own organization. Uh, I don't know how it is in Canada, but in Europe, we hear more and more about uh, uh, the words open innovation. However, open innovation uh, is a means to get external ideas, but in most cases, it's just still following your internal strategy and get some external support in order to implement the strategy. So to me, it's not completely open uh, uh, in, in that sense. So if we really want disruptive ideas, I think that we need to be fully open to collaboration and cooperation in research and innovation projects at global level. So of course, it does not need that we need uh, uh, to, uh, to waste our investment, our background expertise, our IP. I mean, that needs to be preserved. But we need to be ready to share with others. Uh, and I believe that at this stage, there is not enough cooperation in research and innovation between Europe and Canada, especially in the field of IT and telecommunications. And it is a pity because there, there are instruments that are available uh, to support this cooperation between Europe and Canada, and I think we are uh, not using them enough. And I hope that at least one of my objectives today is to try and tell you we need to do more uh, together. And actually, uh, you may have heard about CETA, which is this uh, global agreement that has been signed recently between the European Union and, and Canada to promote more cooperation in very many different fields. Of course, it's a little early to tell uh, whether this will have a real impact in terms of cooperation, of strengthening the, co the cooperation in innovation between Canada and Europe. But at least I believe this is the right time uh, to promote such a cooperation and take advantage of, uh, of this global agreement that has been signed. Now, uh, I also want to challenge you a little bit uh, because this agreement was signed between the European Union and Canada. So how many countries in the European Union? Who knows? Nobody, I know that. 28, 28. Well, in two years, 27. Yes, All right, I was but, say. <laughs> but now 28. However, in the Eureka framework, uh, where uh, there is the possibility to promote cooperation uh, between Canada and Europe, there are more than 40 countries from Europe. So that includes countries such as Israel and Turkey as well. So it's, it's not only the European Union. And it also, by the way, includes South Korea and South Africa and Chile. All right? So there is really the instrument is there, the framework is there. Now, just to, to finish this introduction, of course, uh, cooperating at research and innovation level might not be enough. Uh, and actually, it was very funny because uh, just last week before uh, arriving here in, in Toronto, uh, I was reading a report uh, written by uh, a quite a well-known European think tank. And I must say for once, and it is not very usual, it was talking about Canada. You know, usually we talk about the US all the time, but it's probably the same here, okay? And actually, it was stating that both Europe and Canada are, are now getting quite good at harnessing startups. And, and I must say that 
when, when I look at what is going on in Paris in France, I mean, uh, we, we are really doing good. I mean, in the past few years, I mean, it's been, it's been getting better and better as a startup environment. However, both in Canada and in Europe, unlike in the US, we are still both unable to help those startups grow into world giants. So I think this might be one of the issues where there might be a uh, possibility for cooperation also between Canada and Europe. Thank you, Jacques. Angelique? I'm going to assume this is... Yeah. Um, so again, my name is Angelique, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, the perspective that I wanted to give today was to talk about a little bit about big business, more established businesses um, from a Canadian perspective, and what disruption might mean to a big business versus a small business. So um, just very quickly, 30 seconds on GainX. We have an AI platform, machine learning, uh, that we use in large enterprises globally to help them uh, predict growth and manage and measure both innovation and transformation ROI. Um, we've just turned five years old, and I think if you're, if you're an established business, um, you're looking at how to compete and how to remain relevant in the market in very different ways. We have some established businesses that think that perhaps they don't need to do anything because they're already successful today. Um, but the ones that are really competing, the ones that are getting ahead in the market, understand that it is a continuous cycle of transform transforming and innovating. And in big business today, I think it's really important to consider, and, I'm, and established businesses as well. I know that big business means something very different in the UK, in Europe, in Canada, and in the US. If you're an established business today, I think it's important to recognize that to truly be disruptive, to truly be relevant five years from now, 10 years from now, you can no longer separate an innovation strategy from a transformation strategy. You can't transform today unless you're innovating. And you can't innovate today unless you're transforming. And I thought I would go into a little bit more about what that means and some of the metrics that you can consider um, to become, to remain, to sustain market leadership today. So this is a slide that just talks a little bit about some of what those industries are and where they're sitting with regards to their ability to both innovate and transform. And we all know that the ones that are just rocking it in the market today are doing both. Um, so it's just to give a little bit of a picture of what some of those industries look like. I think some really telling things and an opportunity for Canada to think about is we know that the global 1,000 companies, so the top 1,000 companies across the world spend in excess of, it should be the other way around, $6.4 billion on innovation and digital transformation today. And what's really, really astounding is that over 90% of those CEOs are not happy with the returns that they're getting on that spend. And they've cited several reasons why, which I'll go into in, in just a few minutes. To me, this is an opportunity for Canadians. This means that there's an opportunity for improvement. There's an opportunity to get out and compete against them because there's only roughly 10% of them that feel like they're getting this right. And we can talk about what those 10% are doing. So if you look at different stages of maturity and capacity with regards to innovation, strategy, and transformation capabilities in the market today, most companies fall in what we call either ad hoc pocket or integrated innovators. Ad hoc means your early stage in understanding what innovation strategy means and integrating it across the company. It tends to mean that innovation sits in pockets inside of your organization. It's not integrated with your process. It's not integrated with your budget. It's certainly not integrated across your culture. Pocket means you have, again, pockets of innovation, and the culture is starting to move along, but you're probably sensing a tremendous amount of resistance across your culture. Your business models aren't catching up yet, but you're starting to think about if we start to change some of these business models and bring innovation more in-house, we can probably start to see a more relevant ROI. Integrated innovators means when somebody lands as a new employee inside of your company, they understand how their job, how their role, how their responsibilities, whether they are absolutely junior or sitting on the C-suite, impact not only your company, but your company's position in the market and your customers. 
So there's a broad range of companies just waking up to, to understanding what innovation and digital transformation or cultural transformation means in the market today. And again, I think this is a tremendous opportunity for Canadian businesses. We've scored low, we all know it, over the last several years on a competitive landscape internationally, but we are seeing some really positive changes. And as a big business or an established business, if you think about trying to truly be disruptive, it's bringing your transformation from a cultural and digital perspective together with innovation in-house. So I'll just finish with, um, to be relevant, some of these Canadian companies need to look at not only what's going on in the external market, which I know many are doing, but also internally, and I think many are failing to do a really close observation and measurement of what you're doing internally. When I see what some of the metrics are that big companies are using today, both in Canada and globally, they're looking at what we call vanity metrics. And some companies are starting to wake up to move beyond those innovation vanity metrics. I'll give you some examples. We've launched three innovation hubs across Canada or the globe. Those are vanity metrics. Those are your, those are your investments, not your returns, or how many downloads you got on a particular app how many followers you have on LinkedIn, Twitter, social media. Again, some of your investments to become more innovative, but not the return that you can actually see from a significant bottom line perspective. The, the top 10% that I had mentioned earlier, they have visibility across their entire enterprise with regards to at least the strategic initiatives. So maybe not all the business as usual, thousands or hundreds of projects, but certainly visibility that gives them the real-time ability to respond across that strategic, um, their strategic initiatives. They have consistent, real-time, relative, relevant metrics across the enterprise that everybody understands. So you're comparing apples to apples when you're trying to measure your success. Are we moving forward on our innovation strategy and our transformation strategy? They integrate cultural transformation, digital transformation, again, within the innovation strategy. They no longer are separate strategies sitting in disparate areas inside of the company. And finally, they're, they're um, looking at outdated business models, recognizing that what got you here today is not going to get you where you need to be 5, 10, 15 years from now. So I just wanted to share the high-level perspective of some of the things you could start to think about as an established business. When you're thinking about what to measure with regards to innovation, it is your transformation efforts. It is the cultural changes that you need to see across the organization and what that means down to individual teams, up to regions, departments, countries, and so on, and how that's impacting the ability you have to change at the same pace that the market is. And of course, it's how you're getting a commercial return on things like bringing new innovative ideas to market. So I thought I'd leave it there and wait for some Excellent. questions Thank later. You, Thank you. Samra, maybe you can provide your perspectives on disruptive innovation. Thank you, Namir. Um, hi, I'm Samer Bishay. Uh, a pleasure to be here today. Uh, some of you might have heard my name already before. On Monday was a great day for us. But before I start, I'd just like to ask the ladies in the crowd what you thought of my pink on the sugar mobile shirt. Is it, do you approve? Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this week has actually been uh, uh, a, a good week for us. Uh, there's, there's two decisions that came out that, that were pretty uh, good uh, for us. And I'll just go through the, the, the companies that, that I've I founded Iristel 18 years ago, back in 99, and we've grown to be the uh, largest uh, CLEC in the country that spans uh, all 10 provinces and three territories, coast to coast, to coast. Uh, and then there's Ice Wireless, which serves, it's an MNO serving uh, Canada's rural areas uh, with licensed spectrum in the three territories. And we've, we were the first to launch 3G in uh, Nunavut and uh, the first to launch LTE in the Katavik uh, uh, region, which is Kujawak and 13 neighboring uh, communities. Uh, and then the most exciting one, which is my newest uh, uh, startup uh, that I co-founded, is Kepler Communications. And uh, that's um, it's a nano-satellite company. That is, we're launching our first spacecraft in November this year. As a matter of fact, I brought a model to see 
to show you <laughs> this is the size of the spacecraft that's going to uh, orbit in November 2017. This is not a scaled down model. This is it. And obviously I couldn't get the actual model because it's going through uh, stress testing in, in the labs in downtown Toronto right now. But uh, this is the size that's actually going to be doing a low Earth orbit, uh, 600 kilometer above Earth, sun synchronous polar orbit. And uh, the, the beauty about this is the, the transformation of technology that has happened. And by the way, the cost of this, you'll be shocked. We're aiming for less than half a million uh, dollars per spacecraft. Now, if that was written in the Telecom Act, that would probably cost about a billion, just for reference. <laughs> so, um, uh, the, the point here is, uh, you know, I want to make a, a distinction between disruption and, and innovation. If you're disruptive, you're definitely innovative. But if you're innovative, doesn't mean you're necessarily disruptive. And the reason I, I say that is the last, uh, the last five, thousand years, I would say, humanity in general has been mainly uh, innovative, not so much disruptive. Only the last 15 years, I would say, we're moving in a different uh, realm where we are becoming a lot more disruptive. And the beauty about that is the reason why this is happening is because of all the social collaboration, the internet, the I mean, everyone's smartphone is basically, uh, you could be a journalist, you could be a photographer, uh, your, your home office is, is a lab, it's, it's the most powerful library in the world. Uh, you don't need, I remember when I was, uh, you know, graduating uh, out of university, I used to have to go to the computer lab to do anything. You know, now you don't need to, you could do it with your pajamas and on a couch, right? Um, so, so this, uh, and a good way to visualize the, the difference between uh, innovation and, and disruption is innovation is kind of like a linear local growth. So if, if you were to move 30 steps forward and uh, you know, you're roughly covering about 30 meters, but in an exponential global fashion, you're covering about, you're going around the world 26 times. That's basically you know, uh, the, the analogy there. So. Um, what we have in Canada today is, 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 a, is an innovative market, 100%. We have all the right ingredients. We have the, you know, the Toronto Waterloo Corridor. It's great. It's, it's done a lot of stuff, but we're still thinking linear and local. Uh, in order to go into a paradigm shift to the disruptive global exponential growth market, we need to get a lot of things in place. Um, and, and it starts with, with you know, policy makers, it starts with uh, frameworks, it starts with, uh, you know, the most important I find is, is, which we lack in this country, is the spirit. You could have all the policies and laws that you want to put in place, but if the spirit isn't there to execute on that, you're not going anywhere. And, I mean, we've seen it every day where, you know, you have rules on tower sharing, for example, but guess what? the incumbents will drag to the last day where they have to respond before they respond. And then they respond with something that will delay you even further by another year where you end up with, you know, three incumbents building three different towers because you just can't coexist. Uh, this, this, life, this type of, uh, of uh, uh, process has to be eliminated in order to get to an ecosystem that could lead the world and not be lagging behind. Because right now what we're doing is we might be protecting our interests very short term, our stock options, but long term we're going to get eaten alive because it's a much stronger market force when you're talking globally and internationally. Great, thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Keith. Sure. Hi, I'm, I'm Keith Liu. Um, I clearly drew the short end of the straw because I'm following a guy with a spacecraft. <laughs> so here we go. Um, it's funny, it's coming full circle for me. About 20 years ago, I actually worked as a product uh, manager, product development for Microsell. And at that time, I was actually, you didn't know this, I was actually working on the business model for, for text and charging people for text. Um, since then, I've, I've gone into a number of uh, sectors, including retail, and now I'm working in the, uh, in the healthcare industry. So Click Health is a service organization. We actually started off as a systems integrator 20 years ago. We service uh, biotech, pharmaceutical, large pharma, and, uh, and medical device 
uh, companies. And, and specifically, um, I'm responsible for our innovation mandate as well as product development. So the reality is, and I'm not gonna take an offense to your slide earlier that showed health as the lower left quadrant of innovation. <laughs> um, that is actually a reality. We have a saying in pharma, which is that pharma loves to be first to be second. And, um, and there's a reason for that. Um, we're dealing with people's health and people's wellness and, and their life. And so there's a lot of regulatory, um, something I know nobody in this room understands, there's a lot of regulatory principles and, and things that we'd have to adhere to. And that causes a, almost a natural and, and arguably needed drag on, on innovation and disruption. But, but this conversation is about disruption. And I have a, a lot of uh, clients and partners that, that come and talk to me about the fact that they really, they have this innovation mandate. They've been given millions of dollars, um, this is large pharma, uh, to, to, to execute on their innovation mandate. They're looking for disruptive innovation. And the first thing I tell them is, to what end? I ask them, actually, because the reality of our existence is that we build our organizations to work on quarterly and annual goals to optimize and maximize and, I guess, evolve uh, a business model that works. So the entire DNA of the organization, I'll use a lot of biological terms, the organization is to not actually disrupt. And you know, we heard the term earlier about the clay that exists within an organization. I use a term corporate antibodies. So if somebody comes up with a disruptive idea, the corporate antibodies come up because that's the last thing they want is to, 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 to screw up their business model. I got a quarterly or annual goal. So then what do you do? Because what happens in that case is that somebody who has nothing to lose, and we've, we've talked about this already, will come using all of the tools that have been available and built up over the last decade. We can now spin up a company overnight um, using all of the, the, the capabilities that companies like Amazon uh, and, and, uh, and Google have put into place. Uh, be they plug and play AI components, which are sort of more leading edge, to, to basic infrastructure of the internet. So we are then subject to, to disruption. So how does, how does an existing large organization or business deal with this? So I have a point of view simply from what we've been doing and also what we've observed in, in our space, which is that it starts with really casting and culture. And we've talked about culture. And I'm, I'm talking about casting as well. Um, we tend to hire people within our organizations to help us optimize that working business model, to evolve that business model. They are rewarded uh, for doing just that. They're not rewarded for disruption. Um, and, and further to that, really when we talk about innovation, whether we talk about you know, the, the, the usual tropes about Steve Jobs or, or, um, or folks like uh, Elon Musk, their innovation is actually in connecting the dots, in, in taking things that may have already been uh, created in the past through primary research uh, and connecting it uh, into an idea that that is disruptive and innovative. We, everybody wants to be the Uber of something. Uber didn't really invent anything. They simply connected all the pieces to, to become disruptive. So what you need in terms of casting are people that may not be typical of your core folks that help you run the business. Um, as an example, you know, the reality of our current business model at, at Click is that we're a technology and marketing service company. Um, but on my uh, core innovation or labs team, we have people that are social scientists. We've uh, recently invested in uh, folks that are, of course, in, in, in data science, natural language processing, all this stuff. We have uh, biomechanics folks, a um, whole bunch of other uh, areas. And the idea here is, is it's a weird term maybe, but it's, it's almost like a deliberate serendipity. You create this um, uh, culture or, or, or group of people that are good at connecting the dots and will share ideas. And, and so, so what happens in that capacity though? So lots of people have tried this over the last 10 years. have hired innovation consultancies. I actually helped start one here in Toronto and that has since sold, sold to Cognizant. Um, and they spend millions of dollars in creating a lab or they do a shark tank, right? Or in, in Canada, you know, we, we call it a dragon's den, right? Um, and those are great sort of for, for PR purposes. And they're great to come up with something you can, you can say, hey, this is the innovation mandate uh, be manifesting, right? But the reality of that is that on one end of the spectrum, if you're hiring people that are very close to your core business and skill sets, they're really too close to the business. And they will not disrupt, they will, help come up with incremental evolutionary pieces that help continue to 
move your, uh, your organization in, in, a, in a linear manner. Then you go the opposite extreme where you create a lab, maybe a skunk work somewhere off campus where all these people are doing stuff that's incredible, it's innovative, um, but it actually doesn't have a, a scalability to commercial application. So what we've found in terms of success and what we're seeing out there in our space is somewhere in the middle where you do have a group of folks that are coming from different, um, I guess, backgrounds, working to, together to come up with ideas and also um, interacting with the rest of the organization in, and this is the cultural part, in a very safe manner. Um, there has to be a, a, a corporate culture whereby it's okay to say, you know, I have this idea, I think it's gonna kill our business. And, and I know people have, it's love saying things like, I'd love to disrupt my own business before somebody else does it. Everybody says that. Very few people are actually willing to act on it. And so, you know, without going over my time, um, that's the perspective that, that I have. I'd be happy to talk more about it and, uh, and open it up to other Perfect. folks. Perfect. Well, maybe I'll start with you then. <laughs> first, first question and then switch it. Sure. So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, if you don't disrupt yourself, somebody else will disrupt you. We've heard that uh, a lot. But there are many different players in the decision of what type of culture and who do you hire in your organization. The shareholders are one of them. Do you take risks? Do you hire the, the disruptors that are going to bring your company? Potentially, you know, it's, the risks are too high to do that. So how do you balance that? What would be the right approach to, to manage this process? Because there are realities there. Big yeah. companies, incumbent businesses. Right. Um, so so I, I, um, there are lots of examples uh, uh, about, the ideal, of course, is this fully integrated company and so forth. But if you're almost at the opposite in that uh, perspective, you're a huge, you know, uh, a company that is really optimized for this particular business model, then you need to look at an innovation mandate, creating a center of gravity for talent and a culture for that as almost an insurance policy. Um, I spend an exorbitant sum of money on insurance myself, and the reality is it's that eventuality of a disruption in my health. Again, back, back, back to health. So um, the innovation mandate needs to be part of almost a line item of a budget so that it's at least at the seat of it protected so that the people that you have in there feel safe to experiment. And then um, it's concentric circles of bringing other people in the organization to, to do it. There are multiple models. I can take 30 slides to, to walk through some of those models. I'm sure other people in here um, have a perspective. Uh, a, a, a platform uh, could, could enable this. But the, the insurance policy of making sure that you are inoculating yourself um, against the, the rapid uh, advancement of uh, technology enablement that's happening now, back to the last 10 years. Um, you know, years ago when I was coming up, the idea of a supercomputer, a Cray supercomputer, was this multi-million dollar spend that only academic institutions have. These days we have more than that equivalent power in our, in our pockets. And, and so this allows more uh, of an ecosystem for disruption to happen. So if you are not, um, have an internal capability to look out ahead and do some foresighting on that, you are gonna be caught flat-footed. So don't necessarily disrupt your core business, but make sure that your core business is aware of what's happening and will invest, and there, there are methods to do this, but invest in at least a number of things that allow you to potentially strike it to the next disruptive model, and then you're riding that okay. S-curve, right? Excellent, thanks. So I was gonna ask, Sorry. do you wanna ask a question or? I was going to ask you. I, I wouldn't mind adding to that if sure, that's okay. Please, so yeah. I agree a hundred percent on on all of that. And I think, you know, if you're on the low end of that spectrum in terms of what your capacity is, and you're just starting to think about or invest in innovation strategies, I would just caution not to put all your eggs in one basket on those innovation centers of excellence, <laughs> whatever you want to call them, that innovation hub. Um, you know that. We're gonna start with this cultural of innovation. You'll hear about leaving it on the exterior of the company so that the antibodies don't get it. What I've seen so many times, and we have benchmarked many, many, many big companies across the globe with regards to their capacity to innovate, is those innovation hubs, you know, they tend to take two years to get off the ground. You've invested millions, they seem really good. The metrics are all there. We've got partnerships. We've got VCs that are interested in what we're doing in here and so on and so on. But as you then try to bring it internally into your organization, the antibodies kick in. And so that gap, that chasm between having that innovation center of excellence or a place 
where new ideas are coming to fruition, whether you do the funnel approach from your hundreds or thousands of employees down to those few great ideas, and I would just, I, offline topic, never recommend that approach, but I see it repeatedly. The caution that I want to suggest and the, the um, approach that you might want to take is if you understand, even at the most rudimentary level, what the archetypes are inside of your organization, then you can start to understand how information flows across your organization, and information carries with it innovation. So if you have that center of excellence that you're investing your millions in or your hundreds of thousands of dollars in, and you start to understand those concentric circles that you may want to bring around that if that's an approach, or by starting to extract it from the center of excellence and putting it in different areas across your organization, if you put it into a group, for example, that is consistently made up of what we call guardians, and guardians are, every archetype is important to every single business, but if you're putting something transformative into a group of guardians, it will suffocate and it will not move forward. If you put it into a group that includes critical thinkers and connectors and collaborators, and you are aware of creating that kind of environment, then the information will continue to flow through those concentric circles and be able to expand beyond it. So I'm, I'm just asking you to consider different layers of how to understand your culture with the purpose of understanding how information, which is your innovation, flows through your organization. And I think then you start to see some significant ROI. So Angelique, maybe a follow-up question on that. So you're, you're driving innovation, you've got your culture and the thing, but what are the measures that you need to know that you're actually innovating? I mean, i give you an example. I was on a panel the other day, uh, discussion between FinTech and the banks. The banks have generated 35 billion why should they worry about the, the fintech? I say to them, well, the fintech, if you follow the money, last year there was about $13 billion spent just in Canada on fintech. Yep. So it's an indication that something is happening and that you've got to look into. But what do you advise your clients, your customers, in terms of what are the measures to say, wait a minute, this is shaping differently. I've got to make, right. make something about it. So I, I think looking at the financial services market is a great example of, of how other markets can start to consider this. Because some of the big banks really don't care. Like they don't, they're not worried about the, the startup community. And I think there's something like 14,000 um, fintech companies across the globe. Give or take it, it kind of expands and, and contracts. And to be honest, I think over the next couple years, they don't need to worry about, you know, going out of business because of, of disruptive startups. I mean, I think some of the biggest um, online digital banks maybe have a million customers right now. So they got a long way to grow. So their concern, I think, needs to be in the next five to 10 years, are they going to be able to hold on to their customer base? Because the customer base, it, as it starts to dissipate across those thousands of startups, then is going to affect their ability to sustain that cash balance to be able to continue to innovate. And I, I think the most important thing is to remain relevant. And so, so measures need to be not, and again, I, I see this particularly in the financial services industry, it's one of our biggest verticals, those vanity metrics, which are really, really dangerous, right? We have rolled out five innovation hubs across the globe, check mark. Sure, but again, that's your investment. What are those innovation hubs doing to accelerate your relevance in the market? to bring in new customer base, to bring in, to sustain your existing customer base. And I, I think the earlier keynote was talking about how to be unrelentlessly focused on your customers. Mm -hmm. The customers are constantly changing. I think if you bring some of those metrics around the customers, but most importantly, as a big company like a bank, like a yeah. telecom, you have to back it into what are we doing? What are the metrics that we're seeing that show that we are both innovating and transforming? Because if you continue to use the same business models that you have today, five years from now, I guarantee you will start to see significant loss in market share, in um, customer faith and loyalty and, and so on. So Excellent. it's still high level yeah. metrics, Maybe but I'll important get Jack, uh, I think. Yeah, just, want, I, I yeah. just want to come back to, uh, to a couple of issues that, that were raised and actually on, on the screen we have one of them. Uh, actually, it's not there, but anyway. Enabling innovation through casting and culture and, and what you were saying about how you were trying to strengthen innovation and the disruption mm -hmm. in your own company. Actually, 
one of the things that I have been facing and I have been trying to explain to many people is that you will never have all the right people in your own company. Hmm. Forget it, okay? Even if you are the Google of this world, you will never hire everyone with all the right skills and culture, you know? And, and, and this is really, uh, and, and I'm an advocate of promoting uh, uh, cooperation with other organizations all around the world because I think this is also a way for a company to exchange, get new ideas, and, and share their ideas. Time to time, your idea that you think is the best in the world just doesn't work, okay? And it's not necessarily easy within a company to hear that it doesn't work. But if you start working with other people, then they will tell you bluntly, well, you know, this will never work, you know, and they will explain you why also. So, I mean, there is a, a culture of opening up and sharing some level of information. Of course, once again, we are not talking about sharing the strategy of your company and so on and so forth, but in some cases, it might be very, very good to exchange with people from other countries, from other organizations, with other horizons, uh, in order to, to, to be more disruptive eventually for your own company, you know? And that may also, in a number of cases, help you build uh, some business partnerships. You know, when, when you are ready uh, to, to sell a solution, you know, well, time to time, I mean, you are in a given sector or in a, you are covering a, a, a given geographical area, but then the other organization might cover another, uh, another continent or, or, or sell to another sector. So this is the type of stuff that, uh, that uh, I, I, I would like you know, all of you to, to think about a little bit more because I know we are very much focused on, on what we are doing in our own company and, and okay, but time to time it's, it's good also to think uh, uh, otherwise. A and then I, I was also uh, very surprised by, by this uh, uh, return on investment on research uh, where you said 90% of the, of the CEOs are not happy. Well, I'd like to know the 10% because from my perspective, 100% of them are not happy. They are always spending too much on research. You know, I spent uh, 20 years of my life in a big telecommunications company, and it was always too much, you know, the cost center, the, the research. So this issue of the return on investment on research, I, I developed a kind of a, of a you know, uh, thinking of my own on that, you know. You just cannot think in terms of return on investment in terms of money. Just forget it, okay? I think what you have to think, and actually it's the same question that the governments are asking. It's not only industry. You know, it's also the government. I'm spending 1.5% of GDP in innovation, and I'm spending three, I'm better, and so on. But, you know, the, the thing is, when you look at the successful companies, and you look at how much they are spending in research, then you have the answer. Mm -hmm. If you are not spending anything in research, you cannot be successful. Yeah. That's as simple as this. Can I ask a question to that? Uh, yeah, go ahead, if it's quick, it because is. I'd like to. So, so would you define innovation as research? That's an interesting question. Uh, for me, it's just a matter of, of words, somewhat. Uh, you have to start with research. When I speak about research and innovation, what I mean is uh, research which is closer to the market. I'm not talking about fundamental research, uh, looking at long term or even medium term. I'm, I'm really looking at, at research, industrial research, if you want. So it's just a matter of terms. But indeed, I'm, I'm talking about research that leads to the market within, say, the next two to five years. I mean, when you talk about satellite, it might be different from, uh, from software, all right? But this is, yeah, it's, it's short term, basically. Yeah. If I, uh, I'd like to get to Samer uh, on, uh, I mean, you mentioned about, and we hold, you know, the whole discussion here is about the industry focus. Well, how do you gauge your uh, basically innovative and what, what are the measures to do that? But what, what are your thoughts on, uh, from a government point of view, from a regulatory point of view, what is the litmus test? What, what has to happen for, for us as a country, for us, you know, to think about this and say, well, this makes sense. This, what, what would that look like? Yeah, um, I find, uh, Namir, that we've been kind of centric on a North American culture, and uh, you know what happens south of the border seems to kind of transition naturally uh, to the north, which is not necessarily applicable anymore in the last uh, few years. Uh, I just came back from Kenya a couple of weeks back, for example, and just talking about the fintech stuff. I mean, they have one of the most amazing. Uh, uh, 
uh, programs to transfer cash through this M-Pesa program. Everybody in any village, anywhere, rural, can actually use this system. Uh, point point like, try, that I'm trying to make is uh, the, the, the regulatory and the policy makers cannot use the black and white litmus test anymore unless, like we understand that technology is always going to far, uh, uh, be out far ahead than regulatory. And there's no way the policy makers are ever going to keep up with it, like no matter what we do. So the litmus test has to change to say, okay, is this helpful to the community? Is this hurting anybody? Disruptive doesn't mean it's hurting just because, you know, uh, don't mess with success. That was one of the comments made yesterday on the panel. I mean, to me, what is the measure of success if you're disrupting something to actually drive technology and innovation forward? Uh, so the litmus test and, and, and the scope that we, that we measure mm -hmm. things on sh has to completely change because it's really a global market now. And it cannot be, oh, we got to protect the interests of blue, red, and green anymore, or Aviation. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pilot as a hobby, as a hobbyist, and, and uh, I mean, one of the biggest issues we've been lobbying for Pickering Airport, for example, uh, the Greater Toronto Airport Authority has been fighting tooth and nail to to say that there's enough slots to land planes. And in the reports, how they make the report is like, no, no, we expect bigger planes now to land, so it's more passengers. Yet reality is, what they've done is they've actually kicked off the private small airplanes. Now you need a 48 hour time slot before, before you can actually get a landing slot in. Like that type of protectionism has to go. The litmus test has to change. And it's not just about a black and white policy. It has to be looked from a holistic uh, overall perspective. Okay. If I may, it's, it's many comments on, on what you guys <laughs> talked about, but on this, what's interesting, oh, what you just said is that the regulatory <laughs> uh, body is preparing for bigger and bigger planes. The funny reality, of course, in China and other places, they're working on smaller and smaller air-based vehicles, right? Um, Human-sized drones. And um, so, you know, we talked about regulation. Totally agree that regulation will always be behind technology because technology these days is exponential. Um, so how, again, back a little bit into my space, how do you, how do you prepare for that? How do you push regulation to ch change and adapt for it? And now I'm coming back to sort of the, the KPIs and the litmus test for innovation. Innovation to me personally is, is an idea manifest commercially. And in order for that to happen, you actually have to seed the ground. And seeding the ground is seeding the public. There's a public demand. Governments, regulatory bodies work for the, some, we may have some arguments about that, but work for the people. And so in, uh, in, the, in the healthcare space, the technology that enables wearables today, right? Many of us have these. They might be sitting in your drawer and you're not using it. But th these are basically sensor packets for biomedical information. We have that here as well. Um, my lab, for instance, is right now working on, a, on an algorithm that can, uh, using astrophysics algorithms to separate noise from signal so we can actually get heart rate and, and those other things just by this being in your back pocket. Yeah, measuring it through your back backside. But anyways, um, so, so, so however, if you see all of the millions of dollars, and you follow the money, right? I was at a VC conference this earlier year. Two years ago, it was all about blockchain and fintech, and this year, it's all about AI. The money's going into it, but what you see in the wearable space is that very few devices are actually classified as healthcare devices. They're classified as wellness devices and fitness devices. Why? The reason is, it's because of regulation. The FDA uh, imposes something called a 510 certification in order for it to be a medical device. The technology is good enough. You could take this, these measurements into your doctor and say, hey, look, this is my resting heart rate, et cetera, et cetera. But these companies are shying away from that. Why? Because they, don't, they want to seed the ground. They want to have 100, 200 million users that depend on their Fitbit or whatever their wear, Garmin wearable is and start using it. They also want to, it's not just about regulatory. It's about, again, the, the, the marketplace. The doctors themselves don't want all of this extraneous information. They don't want to know how much you ate today or whatever it is. They, 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 they want uh, the data. So for, back to telecom. Um, if we start uh, working in partnership with, with consumer goods and, and, and other sectors that are in the home, and you're starting to see this with smart speakers, and you know, we heard the Apple announcement and Alexa, et cetera. Start looking at partnerships in which you seed the ground. Um, you create a demand, groundswell of it. Regulation will catch up or have to catch up at that point. And so I'm going to. Oh, it's that. interesting. I mean, it's, it's fascinating because at some point I've always asked myself at what point are we going to see 
in this intelligence data economy, uh, companies, startups are going to take some data from the sports apparels and package it and provide it to the health sector. Sure. But the regulatory aspect comes into play, obviously. Into it, it's it's weird, weirdly yeah. semantics. Like yeah. it, it, it goes, uh, there's all sorts of privacy stuff. It, it affects uh, yeah. telecom as well. When you call it one thing, it's perfectly fine. When yeah. you semantically change it and call it something else, all sorts of triggers of regulation yeah. come into play. But, um, but I, I would also say that um, the, the challenge for all of us across different sectors is actually not your, what you consider your competition today. The disruption, there's arguments to be said that uh, Tesla is not an innovative company, okay? But the argument is this. Tesla will get to a certain point, let's take SpaceX and, and SolarCity out of it. Tesla will get to a point where GM can buy them, in theory. And so the idea is, okay, GM's an aircraft carrier, it takes forever to turn the aircraft carrier. But when you actually turn the aircraft carrier, what do you got? You've got an aircraft carrier coming at you. So at some point, you can allow the innovators to take all that early VC money and so forth to get to a point where the, the, the incumbents could buy them. And that could happen with FinTech as well. The real disruptors, the ones that are called the unicorns, where they're startups that are over a billion dollars mm -hmm. valuation. No taxi company is ever gonna buy Uber. Right? No retailer is ever buying Amazon, right? So uh, no hardware computer manufacturer is buying Google. So these are the ones that actually, as an incumbent, that's what you got to worry about. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Question for, uh, for you, Jack, it's on the R&D. So we hear, you know, different countries have different percentage of spent of R&D compared to their GDP. We hear South Korea, we hear others, corporate. 0.5% on GDP. What is the right measure for this? Uh, first question. And second question, is it, uh, because your role is really to try to entice R&D development between industry and government. But at the end of the day, you're hearing of a whole new movement aside that's happening, the maker movement and the tinker movement, where it's consumer-driven um, development. At, What's your thoughts on that? And, and you've got, uh, you know, MIT, you've got Cambridge is developing this. And we're looking at it as a country, I mean, in terms of the super clusters or something. At what point, what is the mix that you see that is necessary to entice, really stimulate innovation in this space? Well, there are many questions in one. <laughs> so yeah. loaded, let me, loaded questions. Yeah, let, let, let me start maybe with... Uh, uh, innovation uh, uh, and coming back to the definition somewhat of, of innovation. I, and actually when, when I, I read disruptive innovation and I would assume it's a little bit the same for most of the people in this room, the first thing we think about is technology. Okay, however, I mean, and you showed that with, by, by talking also about transformation, uh, disruption is not only in technology. I, I'll give you just one, one example. Um, uh, and, and for once, the French did good, so I will, I will not say otherwise. Uh, a few years ago, uh, they invented something which, which they called French tech. So it was uh, supposed to represent uh, the, uh, the, the, the good in the French technology. In fact, uh, what it did is that it, uh, it uh, helped very much uh, startups and entrepreneurs uh, uh, go global. So they uh, are helping those people and those companies uh, participate in very big fair uh, at world level, all right? And, but in fact, this is all they do. It's a brand. You know, it's n it has nothing to do with technology. It is just a brand. And they have actually succeeded quite well, you know, in making this brand known, you know, and you can see that. I mean, even I, I was in the Mobile World Congress a couple of times uh, in the past three years, and, and you, you had a very big booth you know, French tech with all the startups. I mean, so it's, so innovation can also come from other uh, uh, angles than just technology, you know? So, so that's, that's one thing I, I, want to, I want to stress because we have to think, it might be transformation, it might be processes, it might be, there, there might be other ways. And this is also, you, you may also disrupt things uh, in, in other, in other uh, aspects than, than just technology. Now, you were mentioning the, uh, the super clusters. So I, 
uh, and you mentioned that when we uh, when we prepared this panel, and and I was a little curious, you know, what what are superclusters? Uh, I the, the only other time I had heard about superclusters were uh, was in the U.S. because I'm also working with the U.S. Well, in Europe we only have clusters, you know, but of course here it's super. So <laughs> so you have superclusters. So I looked a little bit. Uh, uh, of course, I may not understand everything that is behind the superclusters, but the way it looked like, it looked like very much like our own clusters in Europe, okay? And it is good and, and it is bad, you know? It is good, this type of clusters, I mean, we've had that in Europe for 15, 20 years, huh? so it's not a new concept and we have a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, uh, experience with that. It is very good, actually, at nurturing the local ecosystem. So, uh, in creating local jobs, uh, around a city, around a province, around a region, this is quite good, okay? Because it's often based on the expertise uh, and the people that are in this particular place. So in this respect, uh, clusters or superclusters are good. Where they have more difficulties, uh, and that's true for Europe, and I'm, that may be true for the Canadian superclusters, although they are all, only starting, so I hope it won't be the case, is in becoming global. Because at one point in time, you know, once you have developed your local ecosystem, there are some opportunity for some of those people, not all of them, but for some of those people to grow more, you know, and becoming more global, you know? Uh, I mean, talking about the Canadian market today, forget it. Uh, how many people are you? 30, 35 million? You know, it's half of France, okay? And France is, uh, you know, what? Uh, 65 million and the whole of, of Europe is 250 and so on and so on. I mean, you need to look at, at the That's global market. You know? and, and this is a challenge yeah. that I think uh, it would be good uh, to take care right from the start. So don't think of, of those superclusters uh, as something only for the local market uh, at provincial level, at, at Canadian level. Think of it from the beginning that at least for part of it, there is a global market. And, and well, this is important. I mean, I agree. I think the whole discussion is saying think globally because at the end of the day, we're going to compete. It's going to happen. And you're talking about CETA and it's uh, 500 million people, $18 trillion economy per year. Uh, you know, we want to be part of that. So I think for a small economy, it's, it's, it's great for us to be on, on that game uh, on this. I have one more question for Ang Angelique, but please prepare your questions after that if you've got some. Um, you know, you've been in the business of growth of companies and, um, you know, you've, uh, you look at this and I was looking at the growth that you're doing and I'm puzzled. What is your success? How do you scale up this? How did you, how did you get to, how do you get to the unicorn that we heard the $1 billion startup? Because that's something that we always talk about in Canada. We're not able to scale. What's the trick? What's the magic here? You know, I, I think it would be, I think I would, be a billionaire if I could tell you that there's a, a repeatable secret sauce <laughs> for startups on, on getting to the unicorn state. I mean, I can tell you about my experience, and I, I'm, I sort of cheekily and maybe inappropriately made the comment earlier that, you know, we just turned five, and um, we were honored by having the Minister of International Trade from Ontario in London, England with us doing a ribbon cutting for a, a pretty cool formal launch at Canada House there a few weeks ago. And we announced with that um, a global partnership with Microsoft. So, so pretty big times for, for GainX right now. Um, and my comment earlier was, you know, I really had to take a moment and think about what it meant to turn five as a young Canadian technology company because it's really, really easy when you're the founder and, and trying to scale at a rate like this um, to not pause and think about what have we accomplished. And, you know, when I was, when I was thinking about this, I, I sort of recognized what I, so I'm a bioarchaeologist by trade and I had referred to the um, detritus of startups behind me as corpses uh, because not many make it to five years old in Canada. And, it made me question, you know, how come? Why have we made it this far? Why, why are we able to now announce a global, like massive global partnership with Microsoft that typically takes three years and it took us 45 days to put into place? 
I think there was a, I think there are, I think startups make some of the same mistakes that the big companies are making, and they get caught up in vanity metrics. And I think Canada, in fact, does this, where we're measuring startup success by the amount of money that they get invested in them. And that's a vanity metric because it doesn't bring an ROI back. It doesn't bring customers to the table. It doesn't bring case studies. It doesn't bring referrals. It just brings money. And most of the companies behind me that have failed blew through that money. You would see them hire 30 people, 300 people, and suddenly a year later, they're letting go 30 people, 300 people or more. And then they do it again. <laughs> and so, I mean, for us, um, I had an advantage of knowing that we were creating a brand new market. There is no innovation strategy management market out there. For us, we've always positioned ourselves as a platform for innovation strategy and transformation, similar to Salesforce positioning itself in CRM, or Great Plains Dynamics, whatever financial system that you might have positioning itself in a financial services industry. There's no equivalent on how to manage your millions or billions of dollars of spend in innovation and, and transformation. With that in mind, though, five years ago when I thought about Gain X, I um, realized it's going to take five to seven years before this market wakes up and starts mm -hmm. to realize that one, we got to take it seriously, two, we got to measure it. We got to be held accountable to our shareholders, to the market, to our customers. So that meant I had time to bootstrap. And that was our secret sauce because I was able to sign up companies like RBC is one of our biggest fans, they're Canada's biggest employers, CIBC is another one. We've got a couple other really big companies that came in behind us and let us partner with them from a technology perspective of, hey, we're going to build this for you, understanding that we're going to make mistakes along the way because that's what you do when you test technology. Um, and yeah, so I think that was a huge advantage. We had the time to get it right. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of the discussion that I hear is that we don't have enough access to financing and capital, but yeah. you're bootstrapping it yourself. You're managing your own money. Yeah. And in, in that way, that defined your success in a way. So it certainly yeah, I did. think time is, is a significant component. Back in, back in um, 1999, I was actually at Chapters Online before we went public. Wow. And I was responsible for innovation back then. I guess I'm old. But anyway, um, and a really brilliant uh, guy came to me and had the idea for creating an e-book. This is 1999. I crushed his dream. I basically... <laughs> I said no to the funding, he hated me, left the company, and he might have gone out on his own. But of course, you know, a decade or so later, Michael Cerbinus and, and Indigo um, uh, exited for $300 million, right, um, their, their e-book company. It's a matter of timing. And on that front, we talk about technology being the driver of disruption and innovation. There are certain technologies that are linear and certain technologies that are exponential. Everybody's familiar with Moore's Law. That's an exponential technology. We talked about wearables earlier and, and cars. Batteries are a linear technology, mm -hmm. right? It is increasing at consistent 2 3% year over year. So if you are smart, like Angelique, you can look at that curve and go, the core of, of my innovative idea is based on these two technologies, computer processing power and battery life. OK, if I map that out, how long before I need a battery to last 30 days without recharging? Because the reason why, by the way, I keep using this example, sorry, you, uh, the adoption is low is that people buy these things and the half-life for them is about 90 days. And they go in a drawer and never get picked up again. The reason is because you take it off to recharge it, you'll never put it back on again. But if I have a wearable that um, I can keep on for at least 30 days, then I'm in good shape. If I have a car that'll last 200 kilometers or miles, sorry, then I'm in good shape. So you can map that out and figure out when you need the money to scale up and when you can bootstrap. That's a really brilliant idea. So, Thank um, you. If I can and also. Yeah. The, I'll just close by saying, interestingly enough, I'm watching the market waking up. And you know, I love, so our, our international headquarters is in, in London, England. All of our R&D and IP stays in Canada. You can't beat it here. Um, and I, I love the analogy of hockey stick growth particularly when I'm over there, because everybody thinks, oh, look at you, sweet little Canadian, you're talking about hockey stick growth. That said, though, when a market wakes up, it doesn't tend to be hockey stick growth, it tends to be a rocket ship. And we are now <laughs> on a rocket ship, and I am now raising, because I need to expand exponentially to be able to support the customer requests that we have coming in. So it's, it's just a great place to be. I, again, I don't know that that's a repeatable model for other startups, but I would just caution that if you're raising, you know why, and you know how it's going to get you to the next milestone. Excellent. 
before, before we get to that, so please prepare your questions. I'm going to open it to the floor after this. Go ahead. No, because Angelique uh, hit on a very important point about the R&D. A lot of companies that are actually successful, they, they are here, but they're not focused on the Canadian market. And this is a problem that I, I want to point out because there's a great R&D program, so there's a few good programs that are kind of disconnected from each other right now from you know, federal government, provincial, municipal, like everybody has great programs, but the, 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 the biggest problem that we have in Canada is we don't see it from inception to fruition, uh, and hence what ends up happening is people end up leaving the Canadian market and going looking for international venues, and while we could be very solid here, chances are, you know, it's just such a pain to deal with it here, other than getting the R&D money, but let's just focus on the outside. And, and talking about Moore's Law, even Moore's Law is becoming extinct. I mean, it's quantum yeah, computing quantum. now. Yeah. I mean, even Moore's Law, which has been there for 100 years, you know. Yeah. So, uh, just want to make the point. Excellent. Any questions? Go ahead. Um, Hi, uh, Peter Miller. I'm a communications lawyer and an engineer, so I get very excited when people start talking about Moore's Law. Um, <laughs> you would also be familiar with Nielsen's Law, which says that internet bandwidth grows by 50% every year. And so that brings me to asking you about broadband and the limits to which broadband drives innovation. We're in a public policy space where it's, we're saying more broadband is inherently good. So we're looking at driving broadband to the home at incredible capacities. Mark Gold and I were talking about this because when you think about when you're home in terms of what it can do for you, even if it's medical, you know, even if it's e-commerce, you don't need massive bandwidth. What bandwidth does is give you a highway to US content and Netflix. So talk about this with me. I mean, broadband from a business perspective, you've got me. But to what extent is there a limit to the innovation that broadband can bring to the residential marketplace? Go ahead. Sir. Well, actually, in uh, in uh, the uh, the R and D program I'm to I'm, uh, I'm I'm chairing, uh, uh, we are having more and more uh, hearing about 5G projects, and I'm also part of a, of an association in Europe which is dealing with 5G uh, industry and government alike as well. I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, the challenge of 5G is not broadband, is not bandwidth. Uh, there are many other challenges that are actually not so much driven by the, the telecommunications world any longer, but driven by other areas that are going to use broadband. The uh, most striking example, the one that we use very much in Europe, because we think this is the one that is going to ramp up uh, probably faster than the other is uh, the, uh, uh, the connected cars and the autonomous driving uh, domain. And when you think of that, and actually uh, I, I, I can also refer to the IoT discussion, uh, I mean this is not about the amount of data that is transmitted. It's more about reliability, security, latency. Can you imagine if your car is able to exchange with the other cars and exchange with the signaling on the road, uh, and it can, for example, break, I mean, the, the exa easy example, break automatically if it detects that something is going on, that, you know, you cannot wait one second for that. You know, this is, this is way too long. So the latency issue is probably the most important one that people are, at least in Europe, are working on at the moment, okay? Uh, uh, so it's, yes, of course, bandwidth is going to grow again, but it might not be the most critical issue for 5G, at least uh, the way we see it in Europe. But a, a follow-up question on that. I mean, what is the business model that for the future for the telcos worldwide? Is it, I mean, I deal with thousands of companies that are getting into data, intelligence economy, they call it. Uh, again, going to the notion on this, and maybe you can answer that question. Is it continue to increase bandwidth, or is it harvesting better data and, and, and being pa packaging it? And so, so, so um, one thing I'll say about increasing bandwidth and things like Moore's Law and, and, and Nielsen's Law is that you mentioned the example of Africa. A, a huge component of innovation or disruptive innovation is constraint. 
And without that pressure of constraint, um, we don't see innovation necessarily. Um, so it's one comment about bandwidth. But the reason why um, Angelique's business is a rocket ship right now is because she created the, her business model on a platform. And if you look at a company like Adobe, for instance, you know, they create um, uh, software to manipulate your photos or, or you know, creative people to sketch, et cetera. In 2007, uh, I think the new CEO took over and he ended up meeting with um, uh, a bunch of his clients. And these C-suite clients were very, he, as he tells it, very um, gracious in taking the meeting but had no idea why he's meeting with them. And he thought, you know, if I was, you know, head of Microsoft or head of Google coming here, they wouldn't question it. So he had the uh, uh, foresight or his team had the foresight to change their platform to a SaaS model. And ultimately what a SaaS model does is it allows you to generate data. And the data ends up, everybody's talking about AI and machine learning. And again, all the VC money is going into it. But AI is nothing without data. The whole point of machine learning is that you're allowing the machine to, to learn off of the, uh, it recognize patterns in this data set, and that's another long topic. So the quality of the data, so back to the telcos, um, if you're the pipe for the data flow, could there be a business model where you're, you don't have to take private information, but you're aggregating the knowledge, again, metadata and otherwise, where it can actually power machine learning and, and AI mm -hmm. to extract insight. Insight that, that are multi-dimensional, like we have a limited bandwidth of how many dimensions we can keep track of, but machines, especially with TensorFlow and some of these other things coming out, um, don't have that dimensionality limitation. So, so there could be a whole business model around, around that, right? Yeah, I'd, I'd like Go ahead. Add something. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, Minister Baines, uh, on Monday, he mentioned that he wanted to create a tension between uh, facilities-based, for example, in that specific context, and uh, uh, price. And I think the tension is actually naturally there, going back to the bandwidth situation where, you know, we're talking about mobile edge computing where everything's kind of being pushed away from the core, everything's being dispersed. Um, the s software, and I mentioned this yesterday in one of the questions, um, software as a notion now is uh, becoming very blurry between what is really hardware and what is facilities versus what is not. Because if everything is in the cloud, okay, well, you're going to grow the facilities, you need the bandwidth, but why are you needing that if it wasn't for the software and the applications that are enabling all this ecosystem? So just, uh, I don't know. Any other questions? Maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Samer one, one last question. And, uh, so we're seeing from different industries, the larger industries, the Microsoft or others, in the past they have proprietary software. I mean, you're talking about the software dimension. They've gone into the open source, you know, engaging basically thousands of developers around the world to develop and expand. Are there parallels that we have to think about with the communications industry in terms of that openness concept? Uh, I mean, you mentioned that, Jack, in, the, in, the, in your, is, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so, I mean, you know, till uh, yeah, late, early 90s, I mean, everybody's talking about supercomputers and all these massive machines that will do all these teraflops of, you know, computational uh, equations. Uh, the world has kind of shifted now to a more uh, spread model, and it started with the software. Uh, aspect where you know you had guys like the Linuxes, you know, open it, get everybody on board, and guess what? I mean, it displaced Solaris, right? Which was Sun Microsystems, but billion dollar, billions of dollar evaluations on on that piece of software, uh, and it displaced it in a very short time. Same thing is happening with uh, you know pushing this whole uh, infrastructure to the edge or the mobile edge computing where if you open it and you push it to the edge, you allow more people to contribute to your uh, uh, facilities. As a matter of fact, I, I, I was just reading something about uh, uh, having 5G networks. AT&T, I, I believe, took the lead on this, where they have it as an open source. So you want to literally build a network. You could do it through some APIs and in, in their own controlled environment. And the idea is if they open it, they could get market share in something that's going to be inevitable Anyways, so they might as well be part of it. Uh, so uh, 
back to that point, you know, so it, it's, it's all about getting everybody to contribute because it's no longer one massive cell that's going to do it all. Excellent. Actually, it's a, it's a trend indeed that, that we see in Europe as well. Uh, I mean, people used to make money out of selling pieces of software and, and they realize it's gone. It's gone, I mean, partly because we are so much used of getting everything for free on the internet, but it's not the only reason. But, uh, and, and the open source uh, uh, ecosystem is, is growing. And even the, the very large companies that, that are still putting lots of money into R&D, into software, and so on and so forth, they are starting to think that, okay, I mean, this is part of the investment that we need to do, but the business model is changing. And I think that's also disruptive. I mean, the thing is that they, are more, they, they understand better and better that they will not make money out of selling the, the, the software. It's not, going, it's not working any longer. So they have to change the business model. They still have to develop the software. Maybe they open it uh, for others to contribute, and they probably are going to make more money uh, uh, around services, you know, uh, around the solution, around the software, but no more in, in selling the software itself. So, this is also okay. some kind of disruption somewhere. Excellent. You know, we're coming right to the end of the, the session. It's fast. You're very fast, this, this whole discussion. Let me put you to the test before you. If I had to ask you to conclude, almost with a tweet or something, what would you consider is, what's your thoughts on disruptive innovation? In a word, in a sentence, um, who would like to go first? <laughs> what, would, what would have to do as a country? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I mean, I, I think the biggest mistake we would be doing is is using linearly driven policies and frameworks to drive an exponentially global market growth. That, like, that would be the detriment to this country, and and we need to avoid that as as much as we can. Okay. Angel. I would say that we have to just root out complacency. There is no place for it anymore. Excellent. Excellent. Well, as a, as a hashtag, it could be, uh, you know, something we are using more and more also. Act local, move global, you know. Interesting. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, don't be motivated by fear. Be motivated by purpose. I could probably right. go on a poster with a cat on it. But, um, but yeah, the explanation being that um, if you are protecting your market all the time and, and, and working out of fear, you're going to be susceptible to the folks that have nothing to be afraid of, and they will come after you. Wonderful. This has been a very interesting, very engaging discussion. I'm humbled. I've actually learned a lot from this. So thank you very much. Big round of applause for the leaders. And look forward to future discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much.